Yeah, uh, I guess hi again to everyone. Uh, today we have John, Jonathan Gamel from Oxford presenting a talk. Uh, I guess you all read the email, but uh, he's a lecturer at Oxford. He there leads the estimation search and planning group and was and is working on various challenging, challenging estimation and motion planning problems. Uh, at least to me, uh, he's most well known for the work on informed planning and contributions to MPL. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to the talk and I would hand the mic over to you, Dan. John, thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here um, and, uh, and yeah, and tell you about some of our work. So as Valentino already said, I'm John. Um, I'm a lecturer at ESP at the Space and Search and Planning Research Group at the Oxford Robotics Institute. Uh, and today, uh, whoops, let's get this working. Um, there we go. Uh, today, I want to talk about some of our work, uh, specifically on multi-motion estimation and in motion planning. And I'm going to start with a little bit of, of motivation. Um, so the field of robotics really has made a lot of progress in the past 10 to 20 years. Um, it's been really impressive progress, right? Um, but a lot of this work has been focused on what I would say are relatively simple problems in the kind of the world of robotics, right? So these are things like self-driving cars, which to be honest, very hard problems. Um, but compared to the, what a robotic problem could be, they're relatively simple because we have an object, oper an, an, an agent operating in a world that's at worst two and a half dimensions. Uh, the, op the agent's relatively stable, is dynamically stable. If something goes wrong, you can come to a stop. And the environment it's operating, operating in is either very, uh, either static or at least it's very highly rule-based, right? Um, we have very strong priors of how people are going to be moving around. And if they break those rules, it's completely valid to stop. It's completely valid to give up and go home if they're not playing by the right rules. Um, but a lot of robotic problems aren't like that. Um, and, and my view is that the approaches that we're developing for such, relative, again, relatively simple problems aren't uh, necessarily going to scale to these harder problems. And by harder problems, I mean things that maybe aren't dynamically stable, that are operating in full six degree of freedom environments, and then operating environments that are a lot harder, right? So are dynamic or unknown or changing or all kinds of the various things we can think of to make things more complex. Um, and so uh, our kind of motivating thesis at ESP is that um, that, uh, that, so, that solving, uh, that developing techniques for these uh, new, more challenging problems is going to require us to kind of re -go, back, go back and look at uh, these problems again and kind of re-understand them a bit more and then and to use that knowledge to design better planning algorithms um, that'll benefit both these kind of next generation of robots as well as uh, the, the current things we're working on. Um, and uh, to that end, I want to talk about uh, multi-motion estimation first and then talk about motion planning. Um, so the majority of work on understanding dynamic scenes has focused uh, recently at least on tracking by detection paradigms. And so this is work where on every frame you try to detect everything of note and then you match those detections between frames. And this works again really well if you're operating in environments where you have strong priors on what you could see. Um, and so things like self-driving cars where you're kind of worried about ca other cars and pedestrians and trucks and things like that, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but it doesn't work so well um, when the world is moving in ways you don't expect uh, or things are moving that you don't expect, right? Uh, because we're trying to detect that object first. Um, if we don't know what it is, we don't try to estimate its motion. Um, and, and to me, this is a little bit counterintuitive because if something's coming towards your face, uh, intuitively you react to the motion before you react to what's coming towards your face, right? And um, that's the whole flinching and all those things like that. And so I think it's worthwhile looking at um, what if we focus on detecting the motion first uh, and then worried about figuring out what it was, right? And that'll make us more robust to environments that maybe aren't operating the way we expect them to or things that are moving in ways that we don't expect um, or multiple things moving or again, just things that should never move moving, right? Um, and the nice thing is that uh, there's this beautiful legacy of ego motion estimation in robotics, right? Visual odometry is probably one of the greatest successes in our field. Um, it's used on every self-driving car, it's flown to Mars, we use it on UAVs, right? And it estimates the motion of the camera as it moves through a static scene um, and then therefore estimates the motion of the robot. And it does that without any prior assumptions about how that robot's gonna move. It gives you full six degree of freedom, full SE3 estimates of that motion. Um, and I think it's worthwhile because I actually kind of like drawing cartoons. I think it's worthwhile to actually think about to visualize how visual geometry works. So we're driving a robot through a world. Um, we detect some sort of salient features in our image at every at any time. We drive a little bit for, far, further forward. We take another image. And then uh, we focus on kind of the consistent set of, of features that we've detected. And we can use that to triangulate our position and rotation uh, between time. And in doing that, uh, we can estimate our motion as we move uh, through this dynamic environment and get this full SC3 estimate of where we were through time relative to where we started, right? And at a high level, 
the pipeline looks like this, a kind of classic VO pipeline. We have images coming in. We're going to run computer vision techniques to detect and match features, turn them into tracklets. We're going to segment those tracklets into an inlier set and then reject all the noise into this outlier set. And that inlier set is kind of the biggest single consistent set of motions. Um, motion, sorry, a biggest single motion. Uh, and then we're going to estimate the SE3 motions that explain the motion of those features. And then I'm making the assumption that those things we saw moving were really static world. We can actually turn that into our motion and estimate our motion uh, in this static environment. And doing that by design, we've thrown away all the other motions, right? Because that's not what we were trying to estimate. Um, these, these other motions are ending up in the outlier set uh, with all the noise. And, uh, and that's on purpose. Um, but what if we didn't have to do that, right? What if instead of throwing away all the other uh, motions, uh, we kept them around and only threw away the noise? Um, and this effectively turns this into a multi, it takes a, a, a kind of a, a noise rejection step and turns it into a multi-model segmentation step. Where we're trying to segment out all the individual motions. And the intuitive thing to try would be to just recursively apply kind of a single model segmentation approach on the outlier set each time and keep repeating that till we decide to stop. Um, and it's intuitive and it can work. Um, but it doesn't work great, and it can be insightful to understand why it doesn't work. Um, so coming back to another diagram, let's think of this as kind of our data input. Uh, so these are uh, our, our features that have been matched and therefore turned into like linear velocities, right? So if we run Ransack on this, a really popular and powerful um, a model extraction technique, it would quite easily find this dominant motion and classify the other motions as outliers. And our hope would be if by rerunning Ransack a second time, we would find one of these models uh, and be able to segment it out and then keep repeating the process. The problem is that the algorithms like Ransack, because they're trying to find the best model in the data, they're inherently going to be greedy in, in support. They're going to find the biggest model that matches. So for this particular data, what actually happens is you'd find this model. You'd propose that what's happened, a rotation about the optical axis, if this was a camera, um, and remove it kind of without considering what's going to happen when you re-segment it again. You're, not, you're making your decision without thinking about future you who has to segment this data again. And you're going to end up eventually um, with, with bits that you can't explain, uh, even in this noise-free case. right? So our data in this case was completely free of noise. Um, and yet, if we kept doing this incremental ransack, we would eventually end up with kind of these leftover feature tracks that we can't explain in any kind of uh, in useful way. Um, thankfully, uh, multi-model segmentation is a pretty well-researched field uh, in computer vision. Uh, and including by some people at Oxford. Uh, so we had a colleague who was doing his PhD under Paul Newman. Uh, so Paul Ameo um, was working on, on multi-model segmentation on things like planes and homographies and, and lines and curves and stuff like that. Uh, so Paul is now a lecturer at the University of Cape Town. And so we developed an algorithm called Coral, which kind of simultaneously considers how well uh, different models fit your data, um, how smoothly those models fit your data, and kind of how complex those models. So effectively, how many models are you considering? And by simultaneously considering those all at the same time, you're better able to segment multiple models out of a single piece of data than if you tried to do that incrementally. So to return back to our toy data, um, what we do with Coral is that we have to express our segmentation problem as a graph and then evaluate a couple different cost functions on that graph. The first would be a classic kind of accuracy, how well does our hypothesis fit the data, uh, where we, you know, where we uh, weight the, the assignment of that label by how well the data is fit by the label. The separate would be a smoothness cost. So our preference is that if parts of the graph are heavily connected, that they share the same label, because that connectivity suggests they should belong together if our graph connectivity carries any information, which it does in our case and in a lot of image cases. And the third is just a complexity term. And so we just effectively try to reduce the number of models we use. So we'll choose to merge two models if doing so only slightly increases our data cost, but you know reduces the number of models we have. And by, um, by evaluating those three costs simultaneously for all our different models, um, we, can we, can, we can segment our data into individual different models, uh, as opposed to doing a greedily one model at a time. And what that lets us do is kind of in our toy problem, we'd be able to run that toy data and simultaneously pull out both kind of this bulk motion and the underlying smaller individual motions, right? And so to come back to the visual odometry pipeline, um, that means we can take this, uh, this segmentation step that previously served to remove noise and replace it with a segmentation step that serves to isolate all the individual motions and also separate the noise, um, and then run individual motion estimations on each motion uh, that we've segmented. Um, and in doing that, estimate all the motions in the scene. And so this is what uh, my DPhil student, uh, my PhD student, Kevin Judd did uh, as part of his degree. I finished last year. And uh, we called it most multi-motion visual odometry um, because it's the multi-motion visual version of visual odometry. 
And so to return, return to this cartoon to illustrate what I mean, uh, instead of rejecting all these individual motions that um, are inconsistent with the static world assumption, we can instead uh, estimate the motions of the objects that would have explained those measurements. And in doing that um, on every frame, simultaneously estimate both the motion of the robot moving through the world, as well as the motion of everything it detected moving, all relative to some initial frame as, as is the case in odometry systems. Um, and uh, in doing this, we get full SE3 estimates, as I said, of everything in the scene, and we don't have to make any prior assumptions about the environment. We're not expecting to see certain objects. Um, anything that is moving will be it, that is big enough and moving by enough, we'll detect as a motion, uh, and we'll try to estimate it. We're not making any assumptions about how many different things are mo moving. So it can be five, it can be 20, it can be one. Um, we're just purely uh, detecting and segmenting the motions and then individually estimating each one. Um, and in that way, as I said, it's directly extending visual odometry to multi-motion estimates of all the motions in the scene. Um, and uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, and so the previous video um, was kind of the, the classic tracklet view of a, a visual odometry pipeline, but now with multi-motion segmentation. And here you can see the SE3 estimates uh, that come out of that segmentation being reprojected into the, the camera view. And you can see we're estimating the motion of these four different objects uh, qualitatively pretty well. Um, and then this is the uh, the full uh, kind of three-dimensional plot of both the ego motion of the camera and those four different motions from the previous video. This is all being done with a single stereo camera without any prior knowledge of what we were going to do uh, as far as motion goes or what the camera is doing. It's just straight strap down a camera, you know, calibrate it, start running it, and then and you'll get all the motions from the scene. We didn't make any, uh, any assumptions about how things are moving. Um, but the nice thing is that if we want, we can start making some assumptions because MVO is this direct extension of the visual odometry pipeline. That means we can stand on the shoulder of all the giants who've come before us in motion estimation. Um, and so we can take a look at some of the more advanced estimation techniques. And so uh, one of the things Kevin looked at was some of the continuous time estimation. Um, so things like white noise and acceleration or white noise on jerk. So these effectively are making these prior assumptions that objects move locally, at least, with very small changes in their velocity. That's the white noise and acceleration assumption. Um, and if we apply, if we incorporate that into the multi-motion visual odometry pipeline, we can, uh, we can actually start reasoning about occlusions uh, while also getting better estimates. And this all comes for free, effectively, out of the estimation. Uh, and then once we're reasoning about the motions of our objects, we can do something we call motion closure, which is where if we redetect a, if we detect a motion uh, in a place we expected a previously lost motion to reappear, uh, then we can recognize that's the same object and use that information to get a better estimate of the motion during the time we didn't see it, without again having to make any appearance of uh, any assumptions about the appearance. We're just uh, we're just using the fact that we've detected a motion in a space in a place in, in the world uh, where a previous motion uh, was heading towards before we lost sight of it. Um, and so this is a, a, toy a toy example of that, where you can see that we're, uh, we're able to interpolate the uh, motion of the swinging pendulum block as it goes in and out of occlusion behind it. And this is the, again, the full um, kind of 3D view of both the camera moving around, the forward, mo the, the moving uh, tower in the front that's occluding it and the, the pendulum moving back and forth. And it works really well uh, as long as the assumptions are valid, right? And so if the object at the very end of this video, the object is gonna stop well behind the occlusion and try to turn direct change in direction. Well, it does change in direction. And um, as you'd expect, that's not a valid, that's a pretty hard problem to ask of something uh, if it can't see while it's changing direction. And the estimator kind of doesn't, doesn't handle that as gracefully as we'd like. Um, but it's never gonna be able to solve that problem. If you're changing direction when no one can see you, there's not much you can do about that. Um, but we can also, just like visual odometry, uh, apply MVO to real world situations that slightly invalidate our assumptions. Um, so it's making a rigid motion assumption, again, just like visual odometry does, um, even though the real world is not exactly rigid, uh, it's probably more likely piecewise rigid, um, but because we have noise rejection, it still works. Uh, so this is a short little toy uh, experiment from outside the Oxford Robotics Institute uh, in Oxford here. And so um, even though that cyclist is obviously not exactly a rigid person, a rigid motion. Uh, it's a piecewise rigid motion, and we're able to, to use noise rejection to just uh, to segment just that motion um, and estimate that motion even as the cyclist moves behind the behind the truck. Um, and again, because we're directly uh, ex uh, working on um, the motions and not worrying about appearance, MVO is is directly applicable to other uh, sensor modalities that can give you these three dimensional tracks through time. Uh, so we've done some pre preliminary work on applying MVO to the output of event-based cameras. 
uh, which we think is a really exciting synergy. So event-based cameras are a sensor modality that detects changes in scenes, which effectively make them predisposed uh, for motion situations. Uh, they only report the change, which is quite often from a motion. Um, and so once, uh, once we were able to, to do some feature detection and tracking in the event camera, we're able to take those output tracklets and put them in, into the exact same pipeline as MVO and able to get, uh, again, six off estimates of the motion, uh, in this case, two cars and the camera panning um, uh, on a road in, here in Oxford. And so uh, it's worthwhile uh, here at this point, now that we've talked a bit about some of the problems of multi-motion estimation, talking about uh, a very important other technique that I haven't really mentioned yet, which is kind of this family of flow techniques, right? Uh, and so it talks specifically about sparse scene flow. Um, so sparse scene flow is, uh, is a technique that effectively calculates pixel-wise velocities um, by, by, by matching features and then calculating the linear velocity. Um, and so it's not making any assumption about the objects either. But it's important to remember that those are linear velocities. And so if you wanted to turn those into SC3 estimates, you'd have to first decide which sets of linear velocities belong to a single rigid body and then turn that into an SC3 uh, estimate. Um, and that is effectively the same segmentation problem we've already talked about, but now it's being posed in velocity space, uh, which can be noisier because you've done that numerical differentiation to calculate the velocities. Also, um, well, you can do sometimes do some geometric cutting to do that segmentation. Uh, it's not always possible as this video shows. So um, in this case, because we have something rotating about the optical axis of the camera, uh, it actually results in flows that are at all angles and all possible magnitudes, right? Um, which means it's quite hard to figure out. You couldn't just use a magnitude segmentation to, to pick out that specific spinning uh, checkerboard. Um, so I want to talk quickly about uh, a data set we put together for this. So as I said, we're, we're really interested in, in specifically the metric aspect of the multi-motion problem. Uh, and we were really struggling to find data sets that had ground truth of about the motions uh, that were sufficient scale. Um, and so, so we had to collect our own. And so we've made it available. It's available at roboticesp.com slash OMD if anyone's interested in it. Um, and so the fundamental, the fundamental idea of it is that all everything that moves in the scene, we have Vicon ground truth data for how it's moving. Um, we've collected data with a couple different sensors. Uh, so there's a, a stereo camera, a wide baseline stereo camera, a, um, a, an Intel real sense, and then an IMU strapped on the sensor payload as well, uh, the sensor payload as well, but it's not the highest quality IMU. Uh, and then Vicon data for the, as I said, the motions and the, and the cameras themselves. Um, we've done it uh, with the goal of kind of trying to scaffold in uh, research and metric multi-motion estimation. Um, and so that includes, excuse me, um, so we, we did a couple different ego motions to kind of highlight the difficulties of the problem. So we have uh, same sorts of scenes uh, collected from a static sensor payload. So you can focus on just the, the dynamic dynamicism of the scene. Uh, we have ones where we've tried to mostly just move the sensor payload in, in the translational direction because rotations are hard. And then a kind of, uh, but then for every scene, there's also one where we've just moved the camera around to always look at the scene from different angles. And it's quite uh, kind of complex motion at times. And we also have a variety of different scenes, um, some that are very kind of simple, like those four swinging boxes, where the goal is to keep the motions kind of independent spatially, as well as independent from a motion perspective, to focus on the segmentation and the estimation problem, to things like the occluding uh, swinging tower uh, situation, where the idea is to focus on what is a, you know, is a clear problem in the multi-motion uh, problem, which is how do you handle occlusions, and then up to uh, what's realistically a, probably a, a maybe a too challenging problem, which is uh, as this data set of six different remote control cars driving around, but we're looking at it with a camera going behind occlusion, running into each other, changing direction. They're being driven by graduate students. So uh, not all the driving is the best. Some of it's really good, but not all of it's great. Um, and so we have a variety of different uh, numbers of cars in these data sets, and they're quite challenging, and we don't mean them to not be effectively. Um, but uh, the data is available if anyone's interested. As I said, it's available on our website, uh, free to use. Um, and if anyone decides to use it, we'd love to hear feedback on whether it's helpful for you. So I'm going to take a, a hard pivot now and start talking about uh, our work on motion planning instead. Um, and so I want to start with our work on informed uh, sampling-based planning. Uh, and so this is the canonical motion planning problem. We have some position we are, some position we want to be, uh, and we have places that we can't pass through in places we can pass through. If we want to express that mathematically, we'd have a start state, a goal state. Uh, we'd have the search space, and that search space could be partitioned into this optical set and the, the free set or the valid set. Quite often, uh, we don't make the assumption that the obstacle set is known in closed form. We assume that all we can do is kind of piecewise, or we can individually check whether a state is valid or not, but we can't list all the invalid or valid states. Um, Within this planning problem, we often uh, are looking to solve one of two problems, either the feasible planning problem, where we're just looking for any 
path that the robot can uh, execute and it is only passing through valid space or the optimal planning problem. And this is the one I want to talk about today where we're looking for the feasible path that minimizes some chosen optimization objective. Um, for most of this talk, I want to talk about path length uh, for a couple reasons. The first one, which is not a trivial one, is that it's the most easy, easiest one to, uh, to visualize. And that is certainly uh, a, yeah, a useful thing. Uh, separately, in a lot of robotic applications, path length is a pretty good analog of our, of our costs we actually do want to optimize. So if you're worried about something like optimize, uh, like energy consumption or fuel consumption or things like that, path, minimizing path length is normally a pretty simple uh, optimization, optimization objective that's a good analog of that. Um, and so historically, there's been really kind of these two big, speaking coarsely, there's been these two kind of approaches to solving these planning problems. Um, one has been uh, these informed graph, or these informed searches on graph graphs like A star, and the other has been these sampling based approximations like R T star. And so um, I want to explain how we get to kind of bring them together uh, by explaining a little bit about both of them. So let's start with with A star. Um, so if our goal was to search this planning problem, and I actually forgot to say this, uh, we assume our, our state is continuous, right? We assume the robot can, can, be, can be infinitesimally repositioned, which is actually what makes another thing that makes this planning problem so hard. If we wanted to apply an informed graph search uh, approach to this planning problem, we'd first pick some approximation, and then and then we'd apply our uh, our informed graph search, right? So A star uh, would starting from the start uh, would uh, figure out who the descendants of that start are, right? So who, where the neighbors are, we check those edges for collision, we calculate their cost, and we'd add those uh, neighbors to a queue. Um, and then we would use a heuristic to select the neighbor that we believe uh, could provide the best possible solution. Um, and then we'd repeat that process on that neighbor, right? We'd evaluate its descendants, check them for collision, calculate their cost, and just keep doing that. And that way, A star is going to expand uh, along the, the hypothesized best solution right, uh, effectively the line straight between the start and the goal until that solution is found to be invalid. And then it's going to widen its search until it's able to find a solution. And in doing that, it's formally guaranteed to find a solution if a solution exists and to find a solution that's optimal. Um, and that's quite a powerful statement. Uh, the condition that's necessary to remember that given that is given that this is a continuous planning problem, uh, A star can only find that to the resolution we chose, um, which can be can be an issue. Um, but the other thing that makes A star so important is that it's also optimally efficient in the number of vertices that are expanded, which means that no other algorithm could be guaranteed to find the optimal solution uh, if it was given the same amount of information in terms of the number of vertices uh, expanded. As I said, the problem in applying, applying A star uh, for a continuous planning problem is quite often, how do we actually choose that approximation? Right? Um, how do we account for the computational budget that we that would take to search that graph? Because if the graph is dense, it's going to take a long time to search, even though it'll contain a good solution. But if the graph is really sparse, it might not contain a solution, even if we can search it quickly. And this, these problems only get harder for high dimensions because of the cursed dimensionality. Um, and the problem is that if we get it wrong, it quite often means we effectively have to start over from a new, different resolution. Um, and so that was one of the big motivating things around uh, sampling-based planning algorithms like RT and RT star was to avoid this need to make an a priori assumption about what approximation we use to, to search the planning problem. So RT star is, uh, is really simple, as a lot of you here already know, um, is that we're going to search this continuous planning problem just by drawing a random sample, um, connecting it to the nearest state in the tree, and then taking this uh, length constrained step along that uh, line. We check that edge for collision. We check that state for collision. If they're both valid, we add it to the tree. And that's that's effectively it for RT, right? We keep repeating that process. And in doing that, we're going to incrementally build this tree and search the continuous space. Um, RT star has extended this by uh, incrementally rewiring the tree during the search. Um, so now when we add a sample, we'll also look to see if any of the new local neighbors could improve the cost to reach that state. And if they can, we'll use the better edge instead. And then we'll repeat that process to see if our new vertex can improve any of the existing vertices in the tree. And if it does, again, rewire the tree and then keep doing this incrementally. Uh, and so in this way, RT star is going to incrementally build and rewire a tree in this continuous search space until it eventually reaches the goal. And then once we find a solution, if we don't like our solution, we can just keep running, right? We can just give it more computational time to find better and better solutions um, until we get one good enough or we run out of time to stop. Um, and so because we're doing uh, uh, random sampling, uh, the performance guarantees of RT star are a little bit weaker. Uh, they're probabilistic. Um, so we can see these algorithms like this are probabilistically complete and almost surely asymptotically optimal, um, which just means that the, um, 
the probability of finding the optimal solution effectively goes to one as the number of sample goes to infinity. It's a bit more subtle than that. But um, the, the, the important thing to note is that it's as the number of samples goes to infinity. And um, you can hide a lot, you can, you can do a lot of things on the way to infinity that don't help you. Um, and historically, there has kind of been uh, some things uh, that we've been, been, have been hidden uh, because the, we've been focusing on this asymptotic tail, I guess. Um, and there's two things I want to talk about that will motivate how we get towards bringing RT star and bit star, or RT star and A star together. One is the question, if we, if we look, think back to our little animation, is why did we search in the top left before we finished searching in the bottom right? You know, as intuitively looking at this picture, if I, if I was asking a five-year-old where to, where to go next, they wouldn't have picked the blue edge. Um, and then secondly is uh, once we had found that initial solution, again, why did we keep searching in the top left? Um, there's no way going up there was going to give us a better solution if we were trying to minimize path length. And in answering these two questions, uh, I'm going to show how we can get to a, a unification of these two approaches uh, that the then leads us on to some new more exciting things. So I'm actually going to answer the second question first, which is uh, how do I stop um, how do I stop searching where I don't need to search, right? So uh, as, I, as we talked about in A star, heuristic estimates of solution cost. Um, provide, give us information about the planning problem. And the other piece of information to give other than kind of the order we should search the problem is what set of states could actually provide a good solution, provide a better solution. Um, and so if that's an admissible heuristic, which means it underestimates the true cost of a solution, then the set of states that it believes could provide a better solution is actually a necessarily necessary sampling condition to improve the solution. Um, and the probability of, of doing that is then bounded by the probability of sampling that admissible informed set. So for problems seeking to minimize path length, the admissible informed set um, that's quite often used uh, is, the, uh, is the one defined by the L2 norm. And that is a prolate hyperspheroid, which is a symmetric n-dimensional ellipse. Um, and the thing to note is that um, because of the ratio of volumes to, of circles to, square, uh, uh, circles to squares, is that the probability of sampling that L2 informed set goes to zero actually really quickly as state dimension increases. And it also goes to zero if you have like a really large planning domain to a small a small ellipse, or if um, if you have a really good solution, like a solution really close to a straight line. Um, but the one that you don't have a lot of control over obviously is the state dimension. Um, and so you can see on the right, this is a plot of the probability of improving a solution from kind of the best case if you were sampling from a rectangle. So this is a rectangle that perfectly uh, bounds the, the ellipse that is the L2 informed set. And it's, uh, yeah, it decreases factorially the probability of actually getting a, a sample that could help you if you draw your samples from that rectangle. But not, all's not lost. You can sample it directly in closed form um, and generate the samples directly in the ellipse. So effectively generate samples that to the best of your knowledge are, uh, could possibly belong to a better solution and therefore focus your search on those that could improve a solution. Um, and so this is a video showing RT star on the left and then a, an informed version of RT star called informed RT star on the right so they're trying to find a solution of equivalent cost. And then once an initial solution is found, informed RG star is focusing a search only on the ellipse, only on the L2 informed set, only on the sets states that we can say without any loss of generality would provide a better solution. And not surprisingly, because it, it, you know, it focuses the search, it ignores three quarters of the world that aren't necessary. Um, you get a, to get to that solution a lot faster, informed RG star. But uh, while that's important and it's useful and it's really helpful um, to obviously improve convergence and, and a lot of problems, it doesn't do anything to find that initial solution, right? So if you're struggling to find an initial solution because the problem's hard, or if your initial solution is really long and circuitous, there's a chance that the informed set doesn't provide any kind of re restriction on your sampling domain. It doesn't provide any information, right? Um, and what we really want to do, if we're going to figure out how to kind of unify these two, we need to figure out how to extend heuristics to the entire search, right? And we need to figure out how to answer this question, the first question which is how do we avoid searching on the top left uh, before we finished searching on the top right? So coming back to the to look at the solution that RT star had found, its first initial solution, um, it looked like this. This is the solution it found. To find this solution, RT star implicitly is considered this set of edges for the samples it drew. Um, and uh, this is actually a graph, obviously, and specifically a graph that we have statistical studies of them. It, it's, a, it's a family of graphs called random geometric graphs. In this case, we've used the R disk connectivity criteria where we consider you know, edges, if there's two states are within a certain distance R. Uh, in this case, we haven't explicitly enumerated the edges. So we've only like had this condition. So it's been an implicit at graph, but this is a graph. And you know, we know how to search graphs efficiently, um, which is, uh, sorry, 
So I, I got a slide ahead of myself. Um, and so what RT star is was effectively doing is it was uh, it was incrementally constructing a random geometric graph while simultaneously searching that random geometric graph. Because every time it added a new vertex to the graph, it searched that vertex, which means that effectively it was doing a random search on this underlying continuous planning problem. And a random search isn't going to be efficient. That'd be a pretty, if we had a fixed graph, that'd be a pretty um, inefficient way to choose to search the graph, right? Um, if we had a fixed graph, we would use A star if we had a heuristic, uh, and that, but that wouldn't be any time. But thankfully, uh, the graph search literature is full of great ideas uh, about how we can we can do informed search on changing graphs and do it in an efficient way. Uh, and that's kind of what we did to bring together the two ideas into BitStar. Um, so the high level, the idea is that we, we select a set of uh, random samples and we view that set of samples as describing a graph, as defining a graph. We never enumerate that graph, um, but in our head, we think of those samples as a graph. And then we search that graph using an informed search technique um, a star or an incremental version once the graph has changed. And in doing that, we evaluate the edges, we search those edges um, in order of potential solution quality, right? So in the video on the right, it's a bit of a toy problem uh, to show specifically this case, but we expand towards the initial solution, then we widen our search till a solution is found. And then once that solution is found, we focus our search on only the set of states that could provide a better solution. So we make this denser graph, and then we carry our previous work forward, and we incrementally up update our search in this new denser graph. Um, by using these incremental search techniques. And then we can just repeat this process, you know, and it can run in any time way until we get a solution uh, that we want. Um, and it's both any time in that it, in it, it returns uh, solutions in any time manner, but it's also any time in the way that it is constantly improving its approximation. We didn't need to make an assumption about what approximation would contain a better solution. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, in a little bit more detail than that video. So here's our planning problem. We've picked some set of samples. Um, which in uh, some connection criteria for those samples, which as I said, that's gonna in define some edge implicit random geometric graph. We're never gonna enumerate it explicitly, but in our head, we think of these samples as a graph. Um, and then we're gonna search that graph using informed techniques uh, by starting from the start, enumerating all the outgoing edges from the start, putting those into a queue, and then using heuristic to figure out which edge we believe could belong to the best possible solution. Um, and then, taking that edge, evaluating it for collisions. If it's collision free, we add it to the tree, then we add the outgoing edges uh, of, the, um, of the target vertex to the queue. And then we repeat that process. And in doing that, we're gonna incrementally uh, build a tree uh, from these samples in a way that is ordered by potential solution quality, right? So we're gonna expand towards the start and then we're gonna start widening our search once we find that no solution exists. And so this, this is actually running on the exact same set of vertices that, that RRT star had used. And we find a solution from that set of vertices that considering a bunch of them that we knew couldn't provide uh, better solutions given the heuristic we had, uh, which in this case was path length. But that wasn't any time, right? That was uh, a single solution from a single batch of samples. I said it was gonna be any time. Um, so once that initial solution is found, we can remove the set of samples we don't need that we, we know cannot provide a better solution. We can add a new batch of samples which again, with some connection criteria is gonna define this now denser edge implicit random geometric graph into which we can carry forward our previous work, our previous edges, and then we just repeat the process. So this version of, uh, of the animation is actually a slightly updated one since the, from, the very, from, from the first one we published, this is one that has been um, a bit simplified uh, to some great ideas of one of my PhD students. Um, so this one only has a single queue. The previous one had, had two queues. Um, but starting from the start, we can now consider the outgoing edges again. Um, and again, use a heuristic, pick the edge we believe belongs to the best possible solution, check it for collisions, add its outgoing edges to the queue and keep repeating this process. Um, because these existing edges, sometimes we're gonna find that uh, when we add an edge, the target vertex is already in the tree, in which case we need to remove its existing connection to make sure we maintain a tree. Um, but again, we just add its outgoing edges uh, to the queue and keep going. The bit that, um, that simplifies it a bit is that we can also recognize that sometimes we'll pull out edges that are already in the tree. And in doing that, um, that's effectively just a sign that uh, that, that vertex is now, should now be expanded. Um, that's information that tells us that uh, we can, we, since we've already uh, done collision checking on that edge, we can quickly just evaluate what, uh, what edges go out of its target vertex. Uh, and in that way, um, by just always processing the edge near queue that we believe could provide the best possible solution, um, we end up with uh, an efficient search towards the goal that reuses the information we've previously done um, and, you know, and, and rewires it and, and searches in order of potential solution quality. And in that way, we're able to bring efficient search uh, into the anytime approximation provided by RT star, or if you'd like, we're able to kind of apply the efficient search of A star to this 
you know, this anytime approximation that's provided by these sampling based planners. So here's a four way comparison of, uh, of BitStar in the bottom right with RT star in the top left, uh, FMT star in the top right, and informed RT, informed RT star in the bottom left. In this case, they're all trying to find a problem of equivalent cost, uh, specifically the one found by FMT star because it's not an anytime algorithm. And you can see that by searching towards the solution and then widening its search and then focusing its search for improvements, BitStar is able to find that solution a lot faster. Excuse me. Um, we did some work with colleagues at CMU um, to, to use BitStar on some high dimensional planning problems. So this is a video of Herb trying to uh, plan for a two arm manipulation problem to move its arms out from underneath the table. So they're actually, you can, there's a little inset in the bottom left of the video. The arms are actually sticking straight out in the table. Um, so there's actually a decent amount of a, a, there's, a, there's actually kind of pretty narrow passage it has to find to get its arms out from under the table to above the table um, and then kind of move them into position to be, uh, to be near opening this bottle of beer. Um, and so this is a series of the solutions found. So BitStar finds the first one in a couple seconds and with more computational time, it's able to continue to improve it. Um, you know, we also worked with some other colleagues at, at CMU uh, to apply a version of BitStar to a, a full-size autonomous helicopter where we had to consider kind of more effort on the edges. So we actually used a CHOMP, which is a, a local optimizer to consider both uh, kino kinodynamics on the edges as well as some local obstacle information uh, when trying to connect individual states um, to work better on uh, on, on systems with dynamics and that we need to plan fast for. Uh, and so there's some simulation results uh, of the autonomous helicopter, as well as uh, some flight data from it. Unfortunately, I don't have too much because of who the sponsor was uh, for this particular project. Uh, I don't have that much I'm allowed to, well, I actually don't have that much I've been given because uh, our colleagues aren't allowed to share that much with us. Um, but so what I find particularly exciting about BitStar isn't the performance on any problem or or the lack of performance on any problem is the fact that by by thinking about a way to unify these two approaches, it uh, to me suggests ways to go forward, right? To ways to go forward to develop new research. Um, and so uh, today I want to talk about our work on adaptively informing uh, sampling based planning. So um, this isn't limited to BitStar, all, but all informed search techniques, the performance of them will depend on how good the heuristic is, right? Admissible heuristics are necessary to guarantee optimality. Um, but quite often to keep them admissible, we have to be pretty conservative about the costs we predict, right? Um, and there's been a lot of research in the graph search literature, again, on ways to, to practically improve the performance uh, when we're using admissible heuristics. So we can do things like weight the heuristics, so they're greedier. Uh, we can do things like truncation and incremental search, so we don't worry about the last 1% of improvement and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, some of the work my, uh, my DPhil student Marlon Stroop did was to take some of those advanced graph search techniques and apply them to BitStar. And so on the left is a version of BitStar uh, that we've already talked about and trying to solve a really simple problem, right? And as we expect, it moves towards the start, then it widens its search until it finds an initial solution. Um, but in doing that, it has to expand kind of all the states uh, in, the, in that kind of ellipse out from the start that run into the wall. Um, and so by applying some graph, uh, by applying effectively some of these advanced anytime graph search algorithms that use inflation heat and truncation, uh, in advanced BitStar on the right, we're able to prioritize the search for an initial solution, even though that initial solution is not guaranteed to be an optimal solution in the given approximation. Um, and then we're able to use the remaining time to kind of improve that solution if we want or bring in a new approximation. And the nice thing is because we know the graph is going to change, um, it's not always worth all your effort to you know, fully exploit the set of samples you have when you know you're about to get you know, twice as many more, right? Um, and so by using these advanced grassroots techniques that have the call for inflation and truncation, we're able to balance how much effort we'll spend on any one batch uh, before we kind of call for the next batch. And in that way, find actually better solutions faster, even if we can't guarantee that the optimal solution for the specific set of samples we found, um, it still results in kind of practical battle performance. And so we've done some work with colleagues at, at JPL to use these uh, planning algorithms on some of their extreme terrain rovers. Um, so uh, this was both Axel, which is a tethered rover prototype in the Mojave Desert, and then uh, Robo Simeon, which is this uh, wheel on limb robot uh, in Death Valley, also in uh, the Mojave Desert, um, on some Europa analog terrain. And so the video on the left is kind of like a mission video of the of Axel. So Axel is, um, as I said, is a, is a repelling, is a tethered robot. It's designed for exploring near vertical surfaces um, on Mars. And the problem with doing that, uh, the reason to do that is there's a lot of interesting science on exposed outcrops. But the problem from a robotics perspective is that the, the transmission delay on Mars is, a, I think it's only ever as low as five minutes and it can be quite, it can be like 10 or something like that. Um, there's quite a big transmission delay and obviously operating 
on a tether on an unstable surface um, is going to make you, require you to make decisions faster than five minutes, right? Um, and so there's an expectation there's going to need to be some autonomy, um, and we need to have some fast autonomy. Uh, and so we've been working, as I said, with, with our colleagues there to bring uh, advanced Pistar and then some of our other planning algorithms into their autonomy stack so we can make faster optimal planning decisions uh, for these rovers, even though the actual planning is quite complicated because you have to consider how the tether interacts with the rope with the ground and how you settle onto the ground and a bunch of things like that. Um, and it's also been used, as I said, uh, on Robo Simeon in the same autonomy stack where they're planning on this uh, very high degree of freedom uh, robot. Um, and so both these papers actually have been published at IROS this year, if you're interested in them. Uh, the first one on Axel was by Mike Pannon, and the second one uh, on Robo Simeon was by Will Reed. Uh, and they're both, they're both really great field work. They're really good work. Um, they were quite, quite proud to have been part of. Um, but I want to come back uh, to my heuristics conversation. Because I said uh, we were going to talk about adapting heuristics, adaptively informing the search, and I really haven't done that yet. I just told us how we could cheat and get more out of our informed search, right? Our informed heuristics. The problem, as I see it, with a lot of the the, the heuristics that we use is that um, they're not exploiting some of the properties of the planning problem. So while the L2 norm is completely a valid heuristic in a kind of an abstract graph, um, we don't have an abstract graph. We have a graph that's embedded in the planning problem. And we can, if we can exploit these properties of the planning problem, we can actually calculate more accurate heuristics. And so I want to, and this, and this applies to both A star and bit star. This is a, just a general problem with heuristic, right? And so you can see that A star, even though it was kind of around the obstacle and in sight of the goal, it still the next state it expanded at this iteration was actually straight backwards. Um, and that's effectively because the heuristic predicted that you could move backwards and then teleport forwards, um, because it doesn't consider any of the connectivities, any of the relationships that exist in a planning problem. And so to illustrate what I mean, this is a blow up of that bit star frame. Um, so we are going to, to have, our heuristics suggest that we should move that, use that edge, edge next, um, the edge that goes down off the, off the bottom, bottom branch of the tree. And that's because of the, the purple estimate of cost to go. And the problem is that that purple estimate of cost to go doesn't consider the actual connectivity of our graph. It just assumes that you know once we get there, we could possibly have this new edge that doesn't touch any of the existing edge I already know about and just jump me to the goal, right? And that is true in an arbitrary graph, but we don't have an arbitrary graph, right? We have this planning problem. We have done some work. We know what the connect. Well, we could know what the connectivity of the graph is. We've evaluated some of those edges. We know that some of them are invalid, and our heuristic isn't using that information. We're 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 ordering our search while forgetting a bunch of things we've already learned, which isn't going to be that great. And if we could get this more precise heuristic, uh, if it was still admissible, um, it actually kind of turns the planning problem to pretty trivial, right? If you have the perfect heuristic, it tells you exactly the states that belong to the, the solution. And all you do is validate them and move on. Um, and the question just becomes, you know, how could we calculate uh, a, a problem-specific and application-specific accurate heuristic that's still admissible? Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, again, this is work of, of Marlon Strube, uh, my PhD student, um, on uh, with adaptively informed trees. Um, and so this is extending BitStar to kind of recast the planning problem into an estimation of a heuristic instead of uh, just a search of the graph. Uh, and so the same sort of thing, we're dry, grabbing this batch of samples, uh, we're viewing it as a random geometric graph, except now, um, before we start searching through that set of samples, we're gonna traverse the connectivity um, and calculate the heuristic over those edges. So we're still using the a priori uh, admissible heuristic that's been given, but instead of evaluating it between a point and the goal, we're evaluating it over the edges of our graph. So effectively, we're changing the integral over which we calculate the admissible heuristic without changing the admissible heuristic. So that means our heuristic is still admissible for this specific graph. It's just more informed. That's just a little bit more precise. Um, so then once we've calculated using that backward search, uh, so we're not doing any collision checking, so it's fast. Um, we then can use that heuristic to order our forward search. And if that forward search detects that that, that heuristic is not admissible, which effectively means if the forward search detects that that heuristic used edges that were in collision, that means that that edge, that, that the heuristic wasn't admissible and we can update the heuristic by, you know, by using that information, uh, by removing that edge and, and rewiring it, and then just restarting our forward search. Um, and then once you know, we finish searching a batch, just like BitStar, we add a new batch of samples to get this new denser random geometric graph. And we, update, we calculate the new heuristic because our heuristic is specific to our approximation and then restart the forward search, again, carrying forward our, our previous work. Um, and in doing this, by 
by being asymmetric in our work between the two, the between the forward and backward search, we're able to pass information. The backward search passes connectivity information to the forward search in, in the form of the connect of the heuristic, and the forward search passes uh, passes collision information to the backward search when it finds that an edge that you, it was that was used in the heuristic is invalid, and that makes both of the searches more efficient. Um, and so I am going to walk you through that one as well. Um, so here's our planning problem again. I think we can skip speed up through some of the preliminaries here. We picked a batch of samples, same batch of samples. Again, same connectivity criteria, except now to search this batch of samples, we're gonna first spend some time to calculate the heuristic. So starting from the goal, we just can do any informed search where we calculate uh, the cost of the heuristic over the edges in that graph, right? So starting from the goal, we expand outwards uh, from the goal to the nearby states. We calculate the cost of the heuristic over those edges, and then we use the queue to grab the next pos best possible one and do the same process, Cut, find its descendants, calculate the cost of the, calculate the heuristic, excuse me, over those edges going out from that state, and then add, it, add its descendants into the, into the tree. And in doing that, we effectively, we grow a, a tree out from the goal uh, towards the start where we haven't done any collision checking. We haven't done any cost calculations. All we've done is uh, calculate the heuristic over the edges. Um, and then with that heuristic in hand, that heuristic is now still an admissible heuristic for this specific batch of samples. Um, or at least we believe it is, this one actually isn't. Um, but then we can just repeat the same forward search as BitStar now using this heuristic, right? So uh, we're gonna use the, the heuristic to pick the edge based off this, uh, this tree. So that will be the heuristic we'd use that says that edge is the one we believe could belong to the best possible solution. We do all the work now where we check it for collisions and if it's valid, we add it to the tree. We do the work of finding who its descendants are and adding those to the queue. And then we repeat the same process, right? We, we pull the next one we think is best off the queue, check it for collisions, add, add, add its edges to the queue and keep going. Um, and we do this until we find an edge that's invalid, right? If, if, it le if this heuristic leads us into an edge that's invalid, that means that uh, the heuristic we actually calculated was wrong. Um, it was wrong in the, in the, in the, at least for being embedded in the free space because it used an edge that didn't belong to the free space, which means that heuristic wasn't admissible uh, on our actual problem. Um, but we can then update our heuristic uh, just by using uh, kind of incremental search techniques again, right? So we now update our, our reverse tree um, by uh, starting from the goal again, or starting from any states still connected to the goal. Uh, and again, calculating this heuristic out uh, from that goal, growing a tree rooted in the goal towards the start where we can reuse any information. In this particular example, there's not a lot of information to reuse, but depending on where the disconnect is, uh, where, we, where the collision we found is, we quite often get to reuse a lot of the information in the backwards tree. And we just continue our search using this new updated heuristic, which again, to the best of our knowledge is still is now admissible um, to pick the edge we believe is the best and continue on searching towards the goal. Um, in this case, if it turned out to be uh, an admissible heuristic, it didn't use any collisions, we found a solution. We can then move on to the next step, just like in BitStar, pick a batch of random samples. Um, we add a new batch of random samples to make a new denser random geometric graph. We carry forward our previous work um, which, uh, and then we recalculate a new heuristic because our heuristic is specific to the approximation and the problem. Um, and so we now have to do another search uh, out from the backwards tree, uh, sorry, a backwards search out from the goal, uh, which is giving us this estimate of the heuristic from the start to the goal. And then we use that estimate of the heuristic to order our, our forward search, reusing the work we've already done having to do the same things we did before where we recognize that sometimes we're going to rewire the tree and sometimes edges are going to have already been checked for collision. And so we can just jump to the expanding their, their target vertices and things like that. Um, Jonathan, can I interrupt? Yeah, uh, just So that I don't have to ask later. Uh, so one thing really confused me, you said that the, that the heuristic is actually was incorrect and was not admissible. Um, Correct. Admissible is a lower bound, right? It's an optimistic estimate of, of distance and the Euclidean distance would also uh, completely ignore right. any kind of obstacles, right? So you're right. So you're right. It, it is still admissible. It is that it was, uh, um, you're right. It's still admissible. It's not as precise as we want it to be. Okay, thanks. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, it, it, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that it wasn't admissible. It was that uh, it was that we had tried to be, uh, we tried to make it very precise and found out that we had um, incorrectly identified. We had, yeah, it hadn't been as precise as we wanted it to be. You're right. Um, yeah, and then uh, when, we're, when we're doing the next search, we can continue that. Uh, we just do the same stuff to reuse the work as we did before, kind of using the, the new updated heuristic that's specific to this approximation. And in doing that, we kind of focus our work uh, on, on evaluating the edges that we believe, you know, on this specific approximation belong to the best solution. 
Um, and so uh, here are results uh, for uh, a random rectangle problems in R8 on the left. Uh, and you can see that AIT star is performing quite well. It's performing better than bit star and it's getting over towards RT connect. Um, and on the right is just a bunch of random worlds uh, in 2D because I don't know how to plot 8D. Um, and uh, you can see how bits, how AIT star uh, does the search towards the goal. Um, and what I think is particularly interesting, there's two things. One is um, this, this is illustrating only the, the search, so only the collision checking. And you can see as a result of the backward search that kind of makes use of the connectivity of the graph, most of the collision checking work is focused around corners of obstacles, which is intuitively what you'd want it to do, but it hasn't been explicitly encoded. That's just what naturally ends up happening because it's around corners that you're more likely to have incorrectly classified an edge as passing through a through an obstacle or as not passing through an obstacle, sorry, when it, when it did pass through an obstacle. The second thing is that because you're doing this connectivity search before you ever start actually searching the graph is that in the cases where the solution requires a narrow passage, if you don't have enough samples in the narrow, narrow passage yet, your graph isn't connected and the backward search can't reach the start, which means you don't waste any time doing the forward search because you can't reach the back, the goal, the, the start from the goal, then you might you need to increase the density of your approximation before you spend any effort searching your approximation. So we're actually getting some of our information uh, into actually choosing the approxi uh, into, into deciding when it's time to search and when it's time to approximate uh, is actually come, and we're getting more information into that aspect of the problem as well. Um, so uh, a little bit of some of the work we're working on. This is all great uh, on problems in path length. Uh, it's really interesting, but not all optimization objectives are as well behaved as path length. Um, some of them are harder to come up with optimization or with heuristics. Um, some of them might not even have heuristics. So what in, in the absence of heuristics, um, an algorithm like A star is going to revert to to depth first or breadth first search. Excuse me. Right, because um, in the absence, if it's zero heuristic, it just becomes a breadth first search, um, which uh, isn't that necessarily that efficient. So this is that was a video of it searching where it's trying to minimize a, a clearance cost, which is a balance between how close it is to the obstacles and how long the path is. Um, and uh, our, this is preliminary work, uh, so I don't want to say too much about it. But we've been looking at what other sources of information we can bring into sampling based planning to inform sampling based planning. Uh, and so let me just restart that video again. Um, and so this is some work on an algorithm called EIT star, which is going to be in the journal version of AIT star, uh, which we'll submit shortly. Um, it's used other information to inform the initial search for a solution before you start using the cost information to inform the search for an optimal solution. And then doing that in a way that balances, um, they're doing that in a formal way. So you can make claims about how optimal the solution you found given the relative to your approximation. Um, and so I said preliminary results, uh, here is are eight versions of that simple problem you just saw. It's obviously a bit of a simple problem, but you can see for optimizing path length on the left, it's kind of a cluster. A lot of the algorithms are doing really well. You can see EIT star is doing the best, but it's not really by much of a margin that's of note. So are things like AIT star and lazy PRM. Um, but when you start switching over to the, the different cost functions where heuristics aren't as available and where the cost is a lot quite expensive to calculate like it is with, with uh, clearance on the right, uh, you can see that EIT star is really pulling away from the other asymptotically optimal algorithms. And most excitingly for us, it's it's over it's hanging out over there with RT Connect, which has come in kind of a bit of a, a goal that's been driving us for a while is to, to understand why RT Connect works so well uh, and to be able to, to, to extend on that information. Um, so that's gonna bring me to the end of, the, of my whirlwind talk here. Um, so to, to summarize, um, I think motion estimation and motion planning are both these are both really interesting fundamental problems for robotics, especially for the next generation of robotics. Um, our work on motion est multi motion estimation has worked to extend visual odometry to, to multi motion visual odometry. So we can estimate the SC3 estimates of every motion in the scene without having any prior knowledge. Um, and if anyone else is interested in that problem, we do have a data set available. Uh, if people would like to get that data. Um, our work in motion planning has been motivated by trying to unify and then extend these really important, uh, you know, techniques, the informed graph-based search and the anytime sampling-based planning into a single approach that both has this anytime approximation and this informed search quality. Uh, and I think BitStar shows a way forward with doing that. Um, and then, and, and, and that has led us to the insight that um, of techniques 
that uh, instead of that recast the planning problem as an attempt to estimate a heuristic and in and, and doing that um, kind of shift a lot of the work into this heuristic estimation instead of into the actual uh, collision checking and edge in the actual search of the of the planning problem. So BitStar, ABitStar, and EIT star are all available for free in Open Motion Planning Library. Um, the data set I said is available on our website. Uh, details about how to get the algorithms are also on our website. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Uh, I have a, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you.